tetro ZM, high school consonant tetro. Thui uite high school consonant tetro. Stjano eight nish quailquin, Ethelson. Unus quintal ethnoquilia, the eight squailquin, a democracy, a tear head head squatto. Men eat ten, stewish, tanasali ethnoc. So be that's a very basic welcome, um, one I tend to use a lot. And uh, on, the end, on the end, I can tag a little prayer and then say to my mother and father that my life is a prayer for them. Um, and that's how I start all my books, too, is, is a prayer to whoever I dedicate the book to. So I have two books out, and that's uh, Taking the Names from Down from the Hill and uh, Little Hunger. Um, Taking the Names took, um, or won the BC Book Prize for Poetry when it was released, and Little Hunger was uh, shortlisted for the Gov Governor General's Award. And uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm happy with both of them. It's, I'm just now starting to think about putting out another book. Um, I thought about it for years, but didn't. Uh, it's one thing to have publishable poetry, but to have poetry that you really care about is a whole other thing. And that's, that's what I try to stick to publishing, is the stuff that I really care about. And when I was in writing school, um, I was often viewed as kind of the sleepy one. Um, you know, I didn't say much. I didn't. Um, I often looked like I was falling asleep in class, <laughs> and um, there was, uh, you know, I was, I was I was late, and my assignments were often late. And uh, but uh, Lorna Crozier, in particular, um, saw some um, saw something in my work that was genuine and and authentic uh, was, and, and that she really liked. This isn't the first poem she noticed that she really liked, but she, it's, it's one that she often references. And it's called Ceremony, and it's a short poem. A crow walks its muddy, kneeless walk across a freshly plowed field. In this light, I see the crow as crows are. So much seems possible. In an attempt to um, explain uh, what losses on a reservation um, amongst the people uh, like this, like my people. Um, there seemed to be a definite and um, what you might call vivid energy uh, around, around what I was feeling. Um, but there seemed to be, it seemed to be so far away the ability to express it. Um, so when this poem came together, I'd been, I'd been thinking about it for a very long time. And what happens very rarely as a poet is you, uh, you write a poem and it's finished. Yeah, um, and this, so this poem has never been edited. Um, nothing's changed about it. It's, it's always been like this. Um, there's a spelling mistake in it in St. Chawson, but I just left it there because, um, it, it didn't bother me so much. And I, often wasn't notified when they're doing reprints of the book. When you're starting to bury your elders at any age, um, the elders I had when I was um, a kid are, are different than the elders I have now. But at any age, when you, when you bury an elder, you're burying everything they knew. And um, it's such a crucial time to be um, being in touch with their, their memories and the things they, they remember about Saanich are different than the elders um, that I was raised by as a kid. And um, they're the same too, they're the exact same things that they emphasize. Um, so that's what I was trying to express putting, um, putting one of our elders in the ground through this poem. Still falling. Below the burial ground, Qantas has taken to its winter form, the echo of its rhythm stumbling hard into this ceremony of grief. Qantas is the name of the stream and the name of the whale that died in the mouth. I say the word and I can see the whale that beached itself there and the ancient man who found it, the fresh water of the stream falling around this enormous, slow-breathing creature the whale feeling its own weight for the first time. I am standing with the man just briefly as he says, Quenis, and looks into the waterfall 
and then at the whale, washed up on the shore at low tide. The winter has always been hard on us. But when a family stands here together, we know just what family is. Look how we hold on to each other as we see the casket sink into the ground, my uncle's body inside. Each of us holds a corner of this story, though some of us have no hands to speak of. It's true. When I feel helpless, I am the only one who feels this grief. Quanus is the name of the stream and the name of the whale that died in the mouth. I say the word and I can see the whale that beached itself there and the ancient man who found it. The fresh water of the stream falling around this enormous, slow-breathing creature, the whale, feeling its own weight for the first time. How long had whales returned here before this one? How long had people come to witness their return, to see them chase the young salmon into the small bay, nearly to the foot of the falls? The body of a whale is like any body, the canoe for an ancient spirit, the water like time moving to the same edge on and on. Still, I feel as though I'm witnessing the first whale to wash ashore here my father's last living brother, uncle, our last handshake and sandwich, this shovel full of dark earth on your grave. So this is a um, uh, kind of a take on um, my introduction to the world. <laughs> it's called the bare story of my life. I was born in a time when the heart wasn't well understood. My mother was alone with me in the hospital most of each day. Though whenever he could, my father would come to be with his dying son, after work, through visiting hours, and more. He would lift me as though practicing something new and ceremonial, away from the machine I was connected to, with wires the color of blood. In his story of this time, he mentions it twice. They were the color of blood. And the circular pad stuck to me to monitor the patterns of my deformed heart. They were a sickly gray, cold and hopeless. My mother and father took turns cradling me alone at the end of the hospital. How odd to think of it now, that in their stories about this time, they are never together with me in that room. A few days before I was released from the hospital and after it had been long determined I wasn't going to live long, a stranger arrived in the doorway of the quiet room. My father would often recall beholding a man whose simplicity lives with him like a great gift. I wish for this child a great life, the stranger said, and his words called a tear to his eye which he captured with his index finger and placed with no small sense of grace at my right temple. Then he turned to leave, barely acknowledging my father sitting there, holding me with an awkward beauty. When I think of my life before my conception, how difficult my decision to come here must have been, knowing the pain I would cause my parents in those early months, knowing how much later, when my brothers and I were left alone here, together, I would trouble them by being lodged so deeply in my own story. My mother never forgot, despite the going on, the carrying on of my life, that I was her ill child. And my father eventually told me that he must have appeared to be celebrating, but he was lifting his glass as though at a wake, in tribute and praise to his dying son. My mother was careful about what she ate when it was my turn inside her. It was already me well before she had problems getting up out of chairs, already me before I had elbows to poke her with, her hand on her tight skin waiting for my next move. It was my presence in her, my nearly unstoppable growing that made her breasts tender her tailbone sore, made her hungry and ill 
so many times. She has spelled out the odds I was up against. Her joke about my arrival, the pill in my tiny fist. When I was old enough to be curious, I asked her about the small round hole in my tummy. She said, that's your belly button. It used to be your mouth. I was a amateur boxer, um, competing on a higher, uh, pretty high level. Um, and because uh, I was being recognized for uh, my poetry, as well as um, my views on decolonization, I, I, f I flew a lot around for, for a while. And while I was away, uh, one time my Auntie Elsie passed away, and, uh, and she was one of my uh, primary Sinchothan teachers. She taught me how to speak. She used to take me camping with her and her family, and all they spoke was Sinchothan on those trips. And, and uh, so coming home became a different thing when she was gone. This is called Descent into Sandwich. A little past midnight, Sanich is scarred with light. Over our islands, both darknesses pervade. I know by heart the sound I can't hear, the water making, as it slides against the east end of our smallest islands and then closes along the west shore. The sound lays claim to me, a child of Sanich. From under the tongue, someone teaches me. One scar of light made into two, the one I judged from a distance, and the one guiding us in. I'm glad for it now that we're close to touching down. The mornings are dark, well, into the steady whir of traffic. Sad machines carrying people many who stopped going anywhere a long time ago. Slanted homeward, you realize you can no longer go home. But don't worry, this is the best of your longing so far. This poem was uh, commissioned by uh, the CBC. They wanted me to write on the theme of home. And the first few attempts I made at writing a poem for this were, were awful, right? There wasn't a thing I liked about them. Because I, what I found is, is I'm a bit like a fish explaining water to myself, you know, when it comes to home. I've had the same phone number, same address my entire life, and I will till I die. Um, and so this has always been home. Um, and it's so ingrained that I, I can't see it really. So this is what I came up with eventually, called Building My Home in Your Mind. In the afternoon, after work, is the best napping time. The best time for coffee and daydreams is ridiculously early morning. The best time to make love is when the high is just going out. The best time for new snow is at the dark end of the walk. When there is a fire waiting is the best time to be miserable, wet up to your knees after you'll hike days into the real trees, real dark. Tears are best held when there are tears rightly put before your own, best offered when you can faithfully recall the one who used to hold you is the one who would hold you through. Late spring is the best fog time. The best trout time comes soon after. When the harshest wind that drives through this town drives through, that's when you'll remember the smallness of your being. This is also the best time to remember how afraid Auntie is of the wind and your love for her and just how she wears that fear. Your mother used to pray for planes sputtering overhead during a storm, which has become the best time to remember your mother's prayers, how you once imagined her voice not dissolving as sound does, but traveling beyond the cold to where the sun was just rising for a humid day and someone so plainly forgot to make their bed for the first time so late in life. The best time to light too many candles is when you wish for too many candles. 
The best time to drink too much red wine is when you've forgotten how sad it makes you and how the cruder machinery of your hometown is slowly drowning out its original song. The best time to lie down on the floor with your dog is after getting drunk with the stupidest people you go on loving. The best time to listen intently to a wind-blown rain is when you are completely apathetic or too art tender. Get exhumed visions of your half-naked father in threadbare gumboots and thin underwear, rattling blindly in the late and early morning hours to turn a garbage can under your bedroom window, knowing how much you love the sound of rain. This is the best time to accept the apologies he never spoke.